Hey guys, it's your favorite reliability test guy here with another fun-filled, action-packed video on reliability tests and validation topics. This current video is on MIL Standard A10H Part 4, and today we will be covering Method 506.6 Rain Testing. Wowzer, that was a big one. I hope whatever that just hit had some serious ESD protection. Haha. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed this video, and if you do, don't forget to hit that like button and subscribe to my channel. Thanks for watching, and let's get started! In this video, we will cover application, test equipment, test procedures, and failure modes to look out for when performing method 506.6 rain testing. So what is rain testing? Rain testing is used to assess how well a system and products protect against rain intrusion and how well they operate and behave in a rain environment. As you are well aware, depending on where a system is used or deployed, it will impact the type of weather conditions it will need to hold up against. For instance, in a tropical region such as the South Pacific, a system will encounter heavy rainfall blowing rain, and other moisture environments such as humidity, which we will cover in the next video. Even if your system is deployed in an arid climate with minimal rain, you still need to consider the entire mission profile, which includes logistics, supply chain, and inventory storage as part of your mission profile, and not only the deployment aspect of a system's mission usage. Exposure to rain could occur while getting stored outside at a storage facility. It could be exposed to rain on an open bed truck and so forth. So when planning your mission profile and test cases for executing your system's MIL standard A10H testing activities, consider your system's entire mission life cycle and the entire supply chain and logistics for potential stresses such as rain that your system will be subjected to out in the wild. So what kind of test equipment is used for rain testing? Well, this depends on the type of rainfall you are trying to simulate. We will get into the procedure shortly, but here are a few examples of rain test types and their corresponding test equipment. The first is rain. Pictured is a rain chamber that uses spray nozzles to provide the desired amount of simulated rainfall at a specified rain droplet diameter and velocity, which we will cover in the next section. Pro tip, a great way to get a jump on the start for failure analysis efforts is to include a fluorescein dye in the water source when performing rain testing. The fluorescein dye will allow you to be able to see leak traces and leak paths inside of your system and where the fault occurred. Next up we have blown rain. Depending on the size of your system, this could range from an easily acquirable turnkey blowing rain chamber to an expensive wind tunnel test for systems that are massive in size such as a full vehicle. You can also get super creative and build your own blowing rain test setup. I've seen in-house setups using items such as an engine from a propeller aircraft as the wind source. So if you just happen to have a spare propeller engine sitting around, you now have a great use for it. The next setup is exaggerated rain testing. This test hits your system with an overlapping spray of malt water from multiple angles and multiple spray nozzles in square patterns or other custom nozzle positions and sizes based on your requirements. Again, this could be a turnkey solution that you could buy from an equipment manufacturer. Or you could really have fun and make your own DIY project and build your own exaggerated rain test setup. For procedure three, test equipment used for drip rain testing is a drip pan for performing drip testing. This test uses water sitting on top of a pan and forced through hollow needles or dimples by leveraging the downward force of gravity and weight of the water to drip water onto your test sample. The size of the water droplet and the amount of rainfall are controlled by the size of the needles or dimples and by the number of needles or dimples that is used on the drip pan. In addition to the rain testing equipment setups, you will also need an oven or a temperature chamber as procedure one and three specify ensuring that your system is a minimum of 10 degrees C or 18 degrees Fahrenheit above the temperature of the rainwater. 
You can also chill the rainwater as well to accomplish this, depending on the what equipment and resources you have available to meet the temperature requirements for these test cases. All right, let's jump into procedures one and two and three now for method 506.6 rain testing. First up is procedure one. Procedure one is broken up into two parts, rain and blown rain. Part A, a rain specifies a droplet size between 600 and 4,500 micrometers. To deliver the rain exposure to your test sample, use spray nozzles similar to what is displayed in figure 506.6-1. You will want to position your dispenser at a height sufficient to ensure that the droplets approach your system at terminal velocity, which is 9 millimeters per second or 29.5 feet per second. Ensure that your flow rate is between 140 and 280 liters per meter square per hour, but tailor that to your mission profile and specific use case as it pertains to the stress effect that you desire. Here are some pointers when setting up Part A rain testing. For procedures one, two, and three, I will state opening up and inspecting your system for water leaks if there are further tests to be performed on your system in a sequence, I recommend capturing pre and post weight measurements for your system to see if it has retained water as a result of ingress testing into your system, rather than tear it down before you've completed all of your testing and damage the seal integrity of your system. Determine your system's configuration for the test. Number of rain cycles if applicable should also be considered, duration of your rain test, parameter levels for storage operation, will the system be sitting out exposed to the elements including rain or will the system be used and operated under rainy weather? You will also need to ensure that you have tailored the rainfall rates and wind velocities to your system's mission profile. Before starting the rain or blown rain test, you will want to measure the rainfall and if applicable, wind velocity to ensure it meets your system's test case. You will also need to perform any pre-test or pre-check inspections to get a baseline of your system before starting the test. You will also need to ensure that your system is at least 10 degrees C or 18 degrees Fahrenheit above the rainwater. Once you have completed these steps, you are ready to start your rain test. After you've completed your rain testing, you will want to run a functional check, visual checks, or even perform a teardown of your system to ensure that your system did not have water ingress into protected cavities or enclosures. Part B details out blown rain. For blown rain, an additional element of wind is added to the test to simulate rain and windstorm. It is recommended to use the wind velocity equal to 59.1 feet per second or 18 meters per second. It is recommended to place the wind source such that it will cause rain to impact the system under test at an angle of 45 degrees from horizontal. You will need to measure the wind velocity to ensure it meets the requirements of your test case for your mission profile. Jumping into procedure two now, we will cover exaggerated rain. This is a design margin type test to ensure that your system is rain tight by using overlapping pressurized water to assess sealant integrity and ingress protection. Again, it is recommended that your droplet size is a diameter between 500 and 4,500 micrometers. You will want to have one spray nozzle to cover up to 0.56 meters squared or six foot surface area and space each no nozzle to be around 48 centimeters or 19 inches away from the system under test. Adjust the spacing of the spray nozzles as it needs to ensure that you, your spray is overlapping with neighboring spray nozzles. Your nozzle positioning from your spray test apparatus should look something like 506.6-2. Let's cover preparation and performance of exaggerated rain testing now. As we covered in procedure one, make sure you have defined all of your requirements for your test case and all conditions, durations, and so forth. Measure your flow rate and pressure to ensure that the rain exposure meets your system's test case requirements. Position your system in a desired test orientation and configure for the spray test. Position the nozzle as required by the test plan as indicated in figure 506.6-2. Spray all exposed surfaces of the test item 
with water for not less than 40 minutes per face. After each 40 minute spray period, inspect the interior of the test item for evidence of free water. Conduct an operational check of the test item as specified in the test plan and document the results. Last but not least, procedure number three that covers drip rainfall. For this test, you will want to ensure that your drip test setup, sometimes called a drip pan, produces a flow rate of 280 liters per meter squared per hour or 7 gallons squared per hour using a drip pan and nozzles 20 to 20.25.4 millimeters or 0.79 to 1 inch pattern. Your drip test setup can use a similar configuration as that as seen in 506-1. Or you could go with a setup similar to 506.4-3. As I've always said in this video series, these are guidelines, so ensure to tailor all of these tests to your specific mission profile. For preparing for and performing the drip test, consider these items. Make sure you have defined your test case requirements and steps as you have discussed in procedure one and procedure two. Ensure the temperature differential between the test item and the water is greater than or equal to 10 degrees C or 18 degrees Fahrenheit. Verify the proper water flow rate and ensure that only separate or discrete drops are dispensing from each of the dispensers. Step three, with the test item operating or not, if this is a storage test, subject it to the water falling from a specified height of no less than one meter or three feet as measured from the upper main surface of the test item at a uniform rate of 15 minutes or at otherwise specified see figure 506.6-1 or figure 506.6-3 visually inspect the test item for instances of water penetration conduct an operational check or the test item as specified in the test plan and document the results Let's go ahead and cover some of the failure modes to look out for with rain testing that results in ingress of water into your system, which includes degraded strength or swollen of some materials that react to moisture, increased corrosion potential, erosion, or even fungal growth, increased weight, which believe it or not can cause catastrophic results depending on your system and its use case. Electrical or electronic apparatuses becoming inoperable unsafe as a result of shortened, aka fried circuits, freezing inside of the material that may cause delayed deterioration and malfunction by swollen and cracking of parts in environments where liquid water is possible during the day and freezing conditions are possible at night. And this last one might sound counterintuitive, but modified thermal exchange. Yes, water is an excellent conductor of heat, but in some cases you can impact heat transfer for your system. It can also cause slow burn conditions with propellants, which is obviously a recipe for disaster. Thank you for watching this video. If you would like to get more in-depth training on reliability tests and validation topics, I offer both a webinar and on-site training. So check out the link above to learn more. I hope you enjoyed this video, and if you did, don't forget to hit that like button and subscribe to my channel. Thanks for watching, and Happy New Year!